Okay, folks, the daily Bible reading. Here we go. We're going to dive right in and see how it flies. September 20th of 2020. September 20 of 2020. <laughs> I'll let that go. 20 of the 9, 20, 2020. Okay, there you go. So, do the 20s mean anything? I'm not concerned with that. Let's dive into the reading, right? September 20th is a Sunday, and we are doing the Well of Nashville. If you're catching this early, the Well of Nashville stream will hit in this same thread, as well as it does on our face, our, our YouTube channel, the Well of Nashville YouTube. You can stream with us there. At the YouTube channel, please subscribe. Sign up and subscribe. They don't charge. They won't bother you. It just helps us reach. In fact, tell your friends like, hey, you know, Carl and Leanne are doing a church gathering, a worship gathering, prayer, study of the word. Check out what they're doing. Subscribe. Help us reach more people. That's what the gospel's about, reaching the world. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, of all people, right? So help us spread the word. But it doesn't cost. Just subscribe. You got to sign up. and got to make an account with YouTube, but no big deal. They won't bug you. You just subscribe to the channel and then you're on if you're threading the Facebook page whoops sorry my microphone came off I'm trying a new microphone sorry about that let's make sure it stays in place like that something like that all right we'll see how it goes <laughs> all right and you can let me know if you like the way that sounds better or the other one the old one but sometimes we couldn't control the volume in that. It was distorting the track sometimes. You'd think I could figure that out, but computers and microphones and things, uh, I'm trying to do this on the fly and do it quick so I don't set it up in my studio with all the stuff. Just doing a, either, like I said, my Walkman Buds or the Sony microphone. So we'll see what it does. All right, let's do it September 20th. Tune into the Well of Nashville at the YouTube channel or this thread. And even if you do the thread, please subscribe to YouTube and, yeah, like it, subscribe it, and spread the word. Help us connect to more people. And also, for just the music, now, the Well of Nashville YouTube is the whole service. I know it's everything, announcements, you know, you get to know us personally. There's the word, there's prayers. You get to see some of the congregation interacting. It's church it's community life. There's worship, the word, prayer, testimonies, everything. The new YouTube channel for Leanne's music is called Leanne Albrecht Worship Tribe. Subscribe to that one too. And that's just where the music's going to land. We're just going to release the songs there, talk about how the Lord is kind of giving us songs right now. Leanne will talk about that process, but mostly it'll be snippets of like how the songs get birthed are little little clips from our worship times where like, hey, there's a moment. That's that's a spontaneous song. You, you you hear us talk about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, like in Ephesians and Colossians, where it says, sing to one another or speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So psalms and hymns are written. Psalms are songs worshiping God, extolling the greatness of God, honoring God. Kind of mostly vertical. Hymns are usually stories about the works of God or man pouring out his heart before the Lord. Those are kind of the hymns, right? Spiritual songs are spontaneous songs birthed in the moment. Now, all songs and all music is inspired in some fashion, but the spirit song in context of worship is like when people are just in musical senses, we would think it's like jazz improvisation or just spontaneous trying things that we're not experimenting as much as we're hearing the Holy Spirit. And songs feel like they flow. And the more you do it, sometimes it's a little phrase that gets sung over and over, or it's a prophetic word that gets spoken, or sometimes words of prophecy or words of encouragement come forth during the music, so there's spontaneous music or prophetic music that births prophetic things, right? Uh, for instance, I think it was Elijah uh, was going to prophesy, says, bring me a minstrel, get me a, a musician, basically, so I can be, see, he was wanting music by which to initiate prophecy. So anyway, I won't make this a teaching, but Leanne Albrecht, Worship Tribe. Subscribe to that too. That's at YouTube. That won't be on Facebook, although there is a Facebook link and Leanne will have a Facebook page for that. That's pretty much to help people find 
the YouTube channel so people can hear this music. And in fact, a lot of the new recordings uh, from the conference, especially the new record, Higher and Higher Live, we have video footage from that, which we put the soundtrack. Those are the actual tracks you hear at the live event, but we just remixed it, uh, you know, packaged it better, but that's what you're hearing at the event. And so those videos will be posted there too. All right, there you go. So I did go longer. <laughs> Carl's five minute introduction. Let's dive in September the 20th, Isaiah 33 through 36. Here we go. A message about Assyria. What sorrow awaits you Assyrians who have destroyed others, but have never been destroyed yourselves? You betray others, but you have never been betrayed. When you, when you are done destroying, you will be destroyed. When you are done betraying, you will be betrayed. But Lord, be merciful to us, for we have waited for you. Be our strong arm each day and our salvation in times of trouble. The enemy runs at the sound of your voice. When you stand up, the nations flee. Just as caterpillars and locusts strip the fields and vines, so the fallen army of Assyria will be stripped. Verse 5. Though the Lord is very great and lives in heaven, he will make Jerusalem his home of justice and righteousness. Got to write that down. There you go, folks. Justice and righteousness throughout all of Scripture. The Lord calls for justice and righteousness. It's part of the fruits of the Spirit, which is kindness, meekness, gentleness, kindness, just doing right, right? There you go. In that day, he will be your sure foundation, providing a rich, a rich store of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord will be your treasure. But now your brave warriors weep in public. Your ambassadors of peace cry in bitter disappointment. Your roads are deserted. No one travels them anymore. The Assyrians have broken their peace treaty and care nothing for the promises they made before witnesses. They have no respect for anyone. The land of Israel wilts in mourning. Lebanon withers with shame. The plain of Sharon is now a wilderness. Bashan and Carmel have been plundered. Wow, folks, that's heavy. Now, pardon me, but I did go back there at the beginning of 33. I know yesterday we read that, those first verses, but I wanted to launch in. So, now we're at the daily reading on the 20th of September 33, starting at verse 10. Here we go. But the Lord says, now I will stand up. Now I will show my power. You Assyrians produce nothing but dry grass and stubble. Your own breath will turn to fire and consume you. Your people will be burned up completely like thorn bushes cut down and tossed in a fire. Listen to what I have done, you nations far away, and you that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Jerusalem shake with fear. Terror seizes the godless. Who can live with this devouring fire, they cry. Who can survive this all-consuming fire? Those who are honest and fair, who refuse to profit by fraud, who stay away, far away from bribes, who refuse to listen to those who plot murder, who shut their eyes to all enticement to do wrong. Look at that, people. Wow. These are the ones who will dwell on high. Ah, folks, that's what we want to be. We want to dwell, not proud or arrogant, but in a place honoring the Lord in the depths of God, so that we are the ones who we shut our eyes to all enticements to do wrong. Yes, Lord, help us. The rocks of the mountains will be their fortress. Food will be supplied to them, and they will have water in abundance. Your eyes will see the king in all his splendor, and you will see a land that stretches into the distance. You will think back to this time of terror, asking, Where are the Assyrian officers who counted our towers? Who are the bookkeepers, or where are the bookkeepers, who recorded the plunder taken from our fallen city? You will no longer see these fierce, violent people with their strange, unknown language. Instead, you will see Zion as a place of holy festivals. You will see Jerusalem, a city quiet and secure. It will be like a tent whose ropes are taut and whose stakes are firmly fixed. The Lord will be our mighty one. He will be like a wide river of protection. 
that no enemy can cross, that no enemy ship can sail upon. For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. He will care for us and save us. The enemy's sails hang loose on broken mast with useless tackle. Their treasure will be divided by the people of God. Even the lame will take their share. The people of Israel will no longer say, We are sick and helpless, for the Lord will forgive their sins. Chapter 34 of Isaiah. And for September 20th, we're going to plow on through. we got a couple more chap chapters. Hang on. <clears throat> chapter 34. Come here and listen, O nations of the earth. Let the world and everything in it hear my words, for the Lord is enraged against the nations. His fury is against all their arm armies. He will completely destroy them, dooming them to slaughter. Their dead will be left unburied, and the stench of rotting bodies will fill the land. The mountains will flow with their blood. The heavens above will melt away and disappear like a rolled-up scroll. The stars will fall from the sky like withered leaves from a grapevine or shriveled figs from a fig tree. And when my sword has finished its work in the heavens, it will fall upon Edom, the nation I have marked for destruction. The sword of the Lord is drenched with blood and covered with fat with the blood of lambs and goats, and with the fat of rams prepared for sacrifice. Yes, the Lord will offer a sacrifice in the city of Basra. Get that phrase. Yes, the Lord will offer a sacrifice in the city of Basra. I will not unpack that, but like the Lord's going to offer his own sacrifices. He will make a mighty slaughter and eat him. Even men as strong as wild oxen will die. The young men alongside of the veterans. The land will be soaked with blood and the soil enriched with fat, for it is the day of the Lord's revenge, the year when Edom will be paid back for all it did to Israel. Now, I won't try to get into the scholarly comments or the history here. That was in that time, I'm sure, and I'm not going to take time to read the footnotes, but I'd like to study the history of that more, so I'm putting a question mark. What, Lord, when was that? Chapter 34, verse 9. The streams of Edom will be filled with burning pitch, and the ground will be covered with fire. This judgment on Edom will never end. The smoke of its burning will rise forever. The land will lie deserted from generation to generation. No one will live there anymore. It will be haunted by the desert owl and screech owl, the great owl and the raven. For God will measure that land carefully. He will measure it for chaos and destruction. It will be called the land of nothing, and all its nobles will soon be gone. Wow, what a shame, the land of nothing. The thorns will overrun its palaces, nettles and thistles will grow in its forts. The ruins will become a haunt for jackals and a home for owls. Desert animals will mingle there with hyenas, their howls filling the night. Wild goats will bleed at one another among the ruins, and night creatures will come there to rest. There the owl will make her nest and lay her eggs. She will hatch her young and cover them with her wings, and the buzzards will come, each one with its mate. Search the book of the Lord and see what he will do. Not one of these birds and animals will be missing, and none will lack a mate. For the Lord has promised this. His spirit will make it all come true. He has surveyed and divided the land and deeded it over to those creatures. They will possess it forever, from generation to generation. Isaiah chapter 35, hope for restoration. Ah, thank you, Lord, for some hope. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon, or the plain of Sharon, right? There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. For your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. 
The parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never, never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beast. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return, though they will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. I love that, the highway of holiness. What an amazing thing, verse 8 there. All right, for September 20th, we're still plowing through up 30, all the way through 36. Here we go. The events during the reign of Hezekiah. Assyria invades Judah. I think we're doing all right. I have a map here, but we're not going to look. <laughs> Chapter 36. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them. Then the king of Assyria sent his chief of staff from Lachish with a huge army to confront King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The Assyrians took up a position beside the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. These are the officials who went out to meet with them. Eliakim, son of Helkiah, the palace administrator. Shibna, the court secretary. And Joah, son of Asaph, the royal historian. Sennacherib threatens Jerusalem. Here we go. Verse 4, Then the Assyrian king, chief of staff, told them to give the message this message to King Hezekiah. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt? If you lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed that splinters between your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. Hmm. But perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? I tell you what. Strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many men to ride on them. With your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops, even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers? What's more, do you think we have invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. Now get that. This foreign king was told by the Lord to destroy the land. Let's read on and watch what happens. Verse 11, Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Assyrian chief of staff, Please speak to us in Aramaic, for we understand it well. Don't speak in Hebrew, for the people on the wall will hear it. But Sennacherib's chief of staff replied, Do you think my master sent this message only to you and your master? He wants all the people to hear it, for when we put this city under siege, they will suffer along with you. They will be so hungry and thirsty that they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Ugh, that is going to be dreadful. Verse 13, Then the chief of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew to the people on the wall, Listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you. Don't let him fool you into trusting in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely rescue us. This city will never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me. Open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grapevine and fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards. Hmm. 
enticing the people. Verse 18 of chapter 36. Don't let Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nations ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? Mm, being a little arrogant here, aren't they? Verse 19, what happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? And what about the gods of Sepharvaim? Did any god rescue Samaria from my power? What god of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? Whoops. Wow, bad statement. He doesn't know the Lord. Verse 21, but the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah had commanded them, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the temple head musician, right? Singer, head singer, Asaph. Also, Joah, son of Asaph, he is the royal historian, right? Went back to Hezekiah. They tore their clothes in despair, and they went in to see the king and told him what the Assyrian chief of staff had said. Okay, for the daily reading here on the 20th, we will pause there and see what they do with that tomorrow. Okay, today's psalm, psalm 4, September 20th, is psalm 64. King David's at it again, folks. The theme here is a complaint against conspiracies. When others conspire against us, we can ask God for protection because he knows everything. Psalm 64, for the choir director, a psalm of King David. O oh God, listen to my complaint. Protect my life from my enemy's threats. Hide me from the plots of this evil mob, from this gang of wrongdoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their bitter words like arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent, attacking suddenly and fearlessly. They encourage each other to do evil and plan how to set their traps in secret. Who will ever notice, they ask, as they plot their crimes. They say, we have devised the perfect plan. Yes, the human heart and mind are cunning, but God himself will shoot them with his arrows, suddenly striking them down. Their own tongues will ruin them, and all who seek them will shake their heads in scorn. Then everyone will be afraid. They will proclaim the mighty acts of God and realize all the amazing things he does. The godly will rejoice in the Lord and find shelter in him. And those who do what is right will praise him. Yes, Lord, we will forever and ever. Amen. And that's the end of Psalm 64. Okay, folks, today's proverb for September the 20th. Yes, September 20th, uh, uh, Proverbs 23, verse 23. Hmm. Ah, uh, get the truth and never sell it. Also, get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. Wow, folks, one verse for today. Get the truth and never sell it. Another translation says, or surrender it. Go for truth and never compromise it. In other words, don't sell it off. Don't make it cheap by changing it according to a deal. Or surrender it because you're challenged to lies and half-truths. Truth is still truth. And also get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. Discernment, like really recognizing, like how to use those two things, right? Thank you, Lord. Help us. Spirit of wisdom, which is in the spirit of those are one of the spirits of God, seven characteristics of God. All right, let's move on. Man, good stuff. Thank you, Jesus. All right, New Covenant reading for today is September 20th. We're doing Galatians 5, picking it up at verse 13, and we'll finish out the chapter. Now I'm going to back up just a notch to 11, because Paul starts the address there, really. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ... No one would be offended. Verse 12, I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. Whoa, Paul is laying it down hard here, folks. Gosh, verse 13. 
Now, picking it up here, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are, that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not out under obligation to the law of Moses. Verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your sinful being, whatever, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurities, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, ooh, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, divisions, envy, envy, being envious, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Oh, folks, Paul, in a, one sentence, just kind of sweeps across the sin list, doesn't he? <laughs> when people say, well, Carl, Paul says we're not under the law. Yeah, but what he's saying is we're not under the condemnation of the law and the, the obligation to follow all the rituals of the Mosaic law. But being in Christ by the power of his grace and through his mercy, we are cleansed from all unrighteousness and sin. So therefore, we, pers we pursue it even in this earthly realm. So when we see ourselves, you know, struggling with things, we cast them off. Grace empowers us to walk in freedom. Yeah. So don't just think, well, yo, Carl, I don't do sexual immorality or impurity or lust or any of that. Idolatry? Well, maybe not. Well, but I... But do you love money more than God? Do you like stuff more than... Yeah, he's not talking about having a little a little icon set up in your house and bowing before it. Idolatry is setting up anything that's above the Lord. That's idolatry. People do that all the time. And we got to bring it down. Sorcery? Sorcery? Do we do that? Conjuring up? No. Do we? No, most Christians don't. But we shouldn't mess around with anything of the dark arts. I don't even mess with it for fun. I wouldn't. There's nothing funny about it. Hostility? Wow, there's a lot of hostility now. Quarreling? Jealousies? Outburst of anger? Hmm. Selfish ambition? Man, everybody, we have, what he's pointing out is like all of our broken humanity always kind of sneaks in in some fashion. All right? So we have to guard our hearts and turn quickly from it and repent and, you know, fall, you know, go towards the Lord more and more when you're struggling. Give it to the Lord. That's how you win. And he says, and all other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm, that's strong words. Now, hmm, this could be a battleground. I won't go into the theological debate. Some people are just lost in misunderstanding or they don't know what they're doing. If they truly love the Lord and know the Lord and they're still struggling, does that mean they're not really saved? Hmm. Uh, theological debate I won't go into. If somebody's truly saved and is pursuing the Lord, they truly believe, their heart should be turned towards not compromising the grace of God and that they should hate their own sin. Like, man, I gave that up. I reject it. I, and if something comes up, you're like, oh, Lord, I hate that. We should hate that in ourselves. But if that's our intent, then we're under the blood, under the grace of God. Yeah, but we can't just kind of mock God, think, well, you know, I've checked off the list. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. No, you can't do that. Well, you can, but that means you don't really love God. You're playing religion. Hmm? Jesus is a little statue in your house, but he's not Lord and God. Hmm? Yeah, okay, another time for that discussion, right? Verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
There is no law against these things. There's Carl's little card. Yeah, yeah. I wrote it down from that, right? Galatians 5. You can see it. That's my reminder every day. I look at that when I'm reading the word like, Lord, am I, am I going for those targets? Yes, we want all the gifts of the Spirit and the Lord. See, he, he'll give us ama amazing things. As we live the gospel, as we tell the good news of the gospel, as we love Jesus, we want all that God has, all the gifts of the Spirit. But if we don't have the fruits of it, if it doesn't show fruit, we have to examine ourselves. Okay, there you go. There's my card. Let's keep going. So there you go. Verse 22. Write that down. Galatians 5, 22. Make your own little card. The fruits of the Spirit. Lord, that's what I want to see. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful life, their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Hmm. Yeah. Help us, Lord. And when we do that, may we turn quickly. In other words, repent and let it go and thank God for his mercy and grace. Yeah. What is that? That is a confession. You know, um, I would be when people say, well, then do we get forgiven again? Or are we forgiven? But we're recognizing it. <laughs> Theologians debate that one, too. I believe if you're in Christ, you're fully saved. All right. And you can confess your sins. It's good to acknowledge your brokenness, your humanity. But if you're in Jesus, it's forgiven. Even as we acknowledge it to the Lord, his blood has covered us. God doesn't, he says he doesn't see our, he doesn't see our sins anymore. Hmm. But we still need to walk in freedom, all right? That's the power of grace. And then the more we know that, the other scripture says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, not my own righteousness. Nobody's good. Even Jesus said that. No, our righteousness is fully in Christ. All right, folks, that's the daily reading. I bless you. We'll see you tomorrow for another one. Have a great day. Bye-bye.